With the appearance of multicellular beings, the evolutionary process produced a surprising new method of reproduction, what we call sex. Multicellular beings do not simply divide in order to reproduce. Each of the two sexes contributes its respective genomes to generate a third being, a descendant which is different from its parents. How can we explain the success of a process that involves such a great expenditure of energy? What advantages does sex offer when half the history of life developed without it? I think the question of why organisms reproduce sexually is probably the hardest unsolved problem in evolutionary biology. You don't have to have sex. Um, organisms can reproduce quite well just by reproducing themselves, splitting in two, or it quite, for example, there are populations of lizards which consist entirely of females, which lay eggs, which have never been fertilized, and those eggs grow up to be females like themselves, never a male in sight. And they do fine. They've probably been around for some tens of thousands of years. You don't have to have sex. So the problem of why you have sex is one that actually puzzles us quite a lot. Perhaps I could say just a little more about that. The, the, the thing is particularly puzzling. Because suppose you can have a sexual population. Um, on average, each female will produce one son and one daughter. Of course, sometimes they'll produce two sons or three or four, and sometimes two or three or four daughters. But on average, they're going to produce one son and one daughter, and that'll just maintain the population. Sex may be an imperfect mechanism, but it's fundamental to the process we have defined as the evolution of the species. During the two billion years of life without sex on the Earth, evolution progressed very slowly, but the arrival of sex brought about a dramatic acceleration in the process. In the space of a few million years, whole species, families, types, and groups of fauna appeared. According to Darwin, those individuals of a species who are most adapted to their environment transmit to their offspring the characteristics which have allowed them to survive and reproduce, propitiating the evolution of features which are beneficial to the organism. In sexual reproduction, each parent contributes genetic material, increasing the probability of different combinations and favoring the increase in variations on which natural selection can act. But what is the basic unit which is the object of natural selection? The individual, the gene, the group, or the species? For some scientists, such as Richard Dawkins, the unit or object of evolution is the gene, whose selfish objective is to gain supremacy over other genes. According to this, organisms would be simply machines of survival containing these genes and the relations between living beings conditioned by this. Sometimes the way in which selfish genes achieve their goal is by encouraging a kind of altruism. Let us take a group of small birds. When a bird of prey appears on the scene, one of them emits a cry of alarm, causing the flock to flee. The bird that emits the alarm signal has put itself at risk in order to save the others. This altruistic behavior is in fact a selfish act in disguise. The bird's real objective is to perpetuate the genes which it shares with the members of the group. But it's a difficult problem for Darwinism to solve, and Darwin himself recognized that it was difficult, but it's not very difficult. One thing that makes it easy is that natural selection favors genes rather than individuals, favors genes that look after their own survival. That's the meaning of the metaphor 
of the selfish gene. And kin, individuals who are related to each other, tend to have shared genes. And so a gene that makes an individual be altruistic towards his brother or his sister or his child or his grandchild will be favoured by natural selection because the genes themselves are likely to be present in the body of the child, the grandchild, or the sister, or whoever it is. So that's one explanation for altruism in wild animals. The key principles of Darwinism are irrefutable. Chance is the origin of variation, and competition is the motor of change. But this is not enough for us to understand certain evolutionary phenomena. If evolution occurs only as a result of small mutations, it is difficult to explain some of the great surges of vital creativity. The first animals emerged as recently as six billion years ago. It was during the period known as the Cambrian Explosion that the first complex beings emerged. The fossil register of the period shows an impressive display of different forms of life originating from a common ancestor. The only vestige of them that remains today is in the form of genetic samples. This strange creature is the Urbilateria. It is the starting point for the rapid and simultaneous appearance of most of the great types of life organization the present-day phyla. Its appearance was responsible for a morphological evolution. Before coming onto the scene, organisms were constituted on the base of radial symmetry. But the new bilateral design of the Urbilateria, with a right and left side coming off a central axis, marked a new path for the intensified development of the complexity of life forms. This creature was the common ancestor of flies and snakes, of mammals, scorpions, and birds, of all the forms of life designed with a right side and a left side, including our own species. How is it possible to explain in Darwinian terms this sudden revolution which produced complex structures like antennae, eyes, claws, articulated legs and mouths? The answer to this question lies in the nucleus of the first cell of a potential living being. Contained within this cell is all the information necessary to generate these abrupt and complex reorganizations. In the last 10 years, more than 350 sequences of a type of gene known as Hox have been discovered. Their function is to direct the architecture of each living being. They distribute and organize each one of the different organs and tissues along the central axis. You could say that they are responsible for making sure that all the parts of a body are in the right place. The Hox genes are arranged in the chromosome in an order which corresponds to the final position of the organs which will develop from them. For example, in a butterfly, we would first find those genes which will lead to the development of the head, then those which correspond to the trunk, and finally those of the abdomen. 
If the position of one of these gene sequences were altered, we would find the equivalent change in the anatomy of the adult butterfly. And it is precisely this correspondence between the arrangement of the genes and the position of the final organs that is common to all animals. This is the clue that points to the Urbilateria as the common ancestor which already possessed this sequence of genes that has been carrying out the same function since then and continues to do so in the fish, arthropods, birds, and mammals that are alive today. The family of Hox genes that controls the development of the eye is practically identical for the arthropods and for man, and yet the human eye is nothing like that of a fly. This is because what gives an organ its definitive shape is precisely the way in which each species interprets the information contained in the genes.